Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by the beautiful Kim Douthit. How are yes. you doing today? I'm doing fabulous. How are you? I'm doing good. I knew I was going to mess up the pronunciation, so I just had to wing it, and I'm so sorry. But uh, <laughs> Kim Douthit, um, I'm so excited to have you here. We were able to connect through social media, and mm -hmm. um, a little bit about Kim for you guys that don't know. Uh, Kim is an actor, director, writer, and educator, as well as a podcaster. Uh, she has a podcast called Ghoulish Tendencies, where her and her mm -hmm. podcast partner cover all things weird, creepy, and the macabre. Um, now, I do want to stop here real quick. Um, you are literally a Jill of all trades and a master of <laughs> every one that I've been able to hear. So um, how did Ghoulish Tendencies get started for you guys? So my podcast partner, Gabby, and I, we... oh. I live right by the hospitals, so there might be some siren action that happens periodically. I apologize. Do we have to speed this up so you can go hide real quick? <laughs> so, I mean, they're not coming for me this time, but like, <laughs> as far as I the know. The night is young. The night is young. And that's how you know it's a good night, is if the sirens are coming for you by the end of it. Uh, you know, my, my podcast partner and I were actually both paranormal investigators, and we met through our ghost hunting group. And uh, we kind of bonded over just like, hey, you know, you like ghosts, I like ghosts, I like to talk, you like to talk, uh, maybe maybe we should do a thing. And we'd initially started a podcast for our ghost hunting group and did, I don't know, like 12 episodes or something, 12 or 13. And we're like, okay, this is cool, but we'd love to do more than just cover some of the Pacific Northwest hauntings. There's so much we're interested in i'm a horror nut i'm a true crime nut um i i love anything weird creepy and growing up in this area you kind of develop a really healthy appreciation for the weird so mm -hmm. i was like let's let's you know this was our great experiment we tried this we got kind of our sea legs under us let's do something now that covers more and and gives us more opportunities and can really be ours. And uh, from there, Ghoulish Tendencies was born. That's amazing. And That's if you ever get super tired of the Pacific Northwest, uh, I know a guy in the Midwest that <laughs> knows plenty of haunted areas. So if you ever want to come out here, we'd love to show you guys around. I think we could have a great time with you. We will um, take you up on that. <laughs> I'm saying we'll have a great time. Ashley, we'll, we'll make sure you guys are taken care of. Um, now you also do, you are a tour guide with Spooked in Seattle as well, mm -hmm. obviously the resident true crime expert. Um, you also make teen horror films with program, with a program through the youth theater Northwest called the summer of horror. And I you do. are now in the fifth year of the program. So yes. is this like a thing where you just get, do, do teens have to sign up for this? Or is this something that is, um, is it like a school almost, or is it just like a big theater group? It's, so Youth Theater Northwest is an educational theater on Mercer Island, which is is local to Seattle. It's a, a kind of suburb of Seattle. And uh, I was a student there back in the day um, as, a, as an actor. And uh, when I moved back to Seattle, the sirens are always coming for me. <laughs> Something exciting must be going down on the streets of Seattle right now. <laughs> wasn't me. I have glasses on. I don't know who that guy was. I don't know who that guy was. wasn't me. I got yeah. I got the mustache. I'm I don't wait. No, it's the, the, it's, the those old disguises, the glasses, yeah. nose, mustache. Those are the best. <laughs> he went that way. <laughs> um, uh, no, but I uh, a couple of years ago, the artistic director was interested in um, starting some kind of film program, and I do film as as well. I mostly on the acting side, but I teach a lot of of film acting classes, and she wanted to do something for. October and like the spooky season. So she's like, let's make some horror films in the summer. Who's our resident horror expert? Hey, hey, Kim. <laughs> so they they approached me about uh, doing, uh, uh, you know, we, we do auditions and um, the program, I think our first year we had like six kids or something and they improv a horror film and it was like both amazing and awful all at the same time. So you can't improv that with a group of teenagers. Like it sure. was just, it was, it was, there was a lot. Um, and so from there, we've kind of gradually grown our staff. We have a, a fabulous screenwriter now who's been writing our, our shorts. This is her second year with us, Sarah Eisenberg, and she's amazing. Uh, and we've got, you know, a guy who does composing and we have an actual editor and, and we've kind of slowly built this up where, you know, I had a ton of kids audition this year. We've got like 
over 20 kids who are going to be across our three shorts. We got uh, our 2021. We had one of the shorts in a couple local film festivals, which was really exciting. And so it, yeah. it's it's really been cool to see this program grow from like a group of misfits who are like, let's make something horror to like, we're actually making films and and showing the students you know this is the process of of being involved in a film making a film and and you could put this on a reel if you wanted and we do a screening in a movie theater and it's really exciting yeah that's really cool and it's it's cool that you can give these kids something to look forward to um you know in, in this world that we're in right now for them to be able to have something positive in their life that can give them strength and you know uh really a resume for the future it's something very, very special that you guys are doing. If you guys don't get told that enough, um, I do also want to talk about because um, fuck them kids, no, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> I do also want to talk about a um, hundred days of horror. This is something oh, I think yes. is super rad. Um, you do a thing called a hundred days of horror, where you mm -hmm. watch a hundred horror films that you've yes. never seen in the yes. hundred days leading up to Halloween. Mm -hmm. You've been doing this for almost ten years now, Kim, yeah. and yeah. you had others join you on this journey now. So mm -hmm. I gotta ask, listen. I understand 100 times 10 is, let me take my socks off. It's yeah. a lot. But um, I know that you've watched a lot of horror films that you had never seen. Is there a certain one to you that's like a diamond in the rough that you've watched in these 100 days of horror that you're like, wow, this is like a movie I, I missed out on growing up, a movie that I wish I would have seen earlier. Is there that one special one that comes to your mind when you oh. think of 100 days of horror as a movie that really affected you and meant a lot to you that you never seen when you were younger? I uh, I saw Ravenous for the first time during Hundred Days of Horror, and which was you know I, I think that came out in like ninety nine or something. So it, it it wouldn't have been one I would have seen when I was well, was still a teenager then I guess. Uh, but that's one that when it comes time for me, like when I make my best of Hundred Days of Horror across the the years, that one I always come back to. And I think it's such a fantastic film. You've got Robert Carlyle who could just kind of stand there and be brilliant um yeah. but it's 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 also you know western horror there's not enough of it and i love i love uh any kind of of horror and and like horror that takes place in the past a period piece that's not just victorian or gothic right. or 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 even like you're just you're kind of more traditional ghost story i love something that does that does something a little different and there's not there's not enough of it. Like, um, Ravenous always comes to mind. Bone Tomahawk was another that, that I saw during 100 Love Days Bone of Home. Bone Tomahawk. So good. And brutal. Just I have, uh, brutal. I have the movie poster downstairs, actually. I'm a huge Bone Tomahawk fan. Like, it's such a good movie. I'm so glad you brought that up because I love that movie so much. Such an underrated gem. Like, so such underrated. A, such a good movie. Yeah. And so, one, too, that you can get people who aren't necessarily horror fans to get behind. Because yeah. you've got all this great cast and you've got a, a storyline that's not strictly like zombies. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and Ashley loves that one too. We were lucky enough to actually screen that one and it was so Ooh. cool. And to see what, it's actually gained like a big cult following now. And it's really mm -hmm. awesome to see the love and appreciation that that movie's finally getting. So I'm very happy that that's a movie that you just brought up. And if you guys haven't seen it, you need to check out Bone Tomahawk. Yes. It's so great. And while we're on the subject of checking things out, there's a couple of links down here in the description where you can follow Kim on social media. So make sure that you're clicking these links. Give her a follow on social media. Make sure you're subscribing to the podcast so you can check that out. I promise you, you won't regret it. And maybe someday you'll see us together uh, going uh, douth it and sledgehammer, doing some paranormal stuff. So I would yes. love to make that happen. And Gabby as well, obviously. So um, we know what you got going on in the future, Kim, and we know what you're doing now. But here for a little bit, I'd like to take you back to the past. And talk okay. about how horror started for you, your first horror movie. And I can honestly say this is the first time in over 300 episodes I've had the privilege of talking about this film on the podcast. So, Kim, your first horror movie was? Squirm. <laughs> Which is such a weird, delightful, strange little movie about killer worms. Mm -hmm. uh, from 1976. And you have... Uh, there's this big storm and it knocks over power lines which electrifies the ground and the mud and the worms and mm -hmm. so the worms just get like supercharged and these aren't you know because i didn't realize there was actually worms like this these are these are real worms these like yeah. vicious 
They have teeth. They're terrifying. They're disgusting. These are They're not amazing. the worms you go fishing with. I, they bite you back. Like they would try to eat the fish. They're like piranhas of worms. Like I didn't know these existed. Right. And I saw this movie for the first time. I think I was five, uh, thereabouts. Oh, I was little. Yeah, I was little. Um, and worms were, you know, those cute little earthworms you found in the garden. I was like, these aren't real, are they? And my mom's like, uh. <laughs> about that <laughs> i don't want to be the one to tell you this but also yeah kid they're real <laughs> right and it, it's amazing because you talk about how you were a, a very young lady the first time you had seen this but um you talk about how you and your mom had a conversation was your mom the person that introduced you to squirm she was uh my mom was actually all of my kind of horror beginnings start with with my mom um she isn't quite as hardcore as I am now, but she loves a good scary movie. Uh, we we kind of have set out to try to convince my dad to go see some. My dad's not a scary movie person. Like I was trying to convince him that it was actually called IT, and it was about you know <laughs> in-house technicians. Uh, it almost worked. I was like this close to getting him to believe that, and then I think he saw a trailer and he was like, "What are you doing? What is what is this? What's right?" <laughs> No, no. I just imagine him calling you at like 11 o'clock at night like, Kim, I just saw a commercial for IT on the television and we need to have a conversation. <laughs> so I'm very disappointed in you, young lady face. But I'm like, at this point, Dad, it's I'll recommend a movie I, and he looks at me and he's like, is that a horror film? Be honest. Is that a horror film? <laughs> no. Right. Well, maybe not to me. What is so, horror? Um, obviously... Right. Well, and it's funny you say that because, I mean, I genuinely have that conversation all the time. Like, what makes a movie a horror movie? And I think that's the hardest genre to nail down because what makes a comedy? Well, I got to laugh. What makes yeah. a drama? Well, I got to feel. What mm -hmm. makes a horror movie? I don't fucking know. Like, like <laughs> people ask me, you know, like, uh, well, it's got to be scary. I'm going to be mm -hmm. completely honest with you. And I've said this before. The large march scene in Pee Wee's Big Adventure has scared me more mm -hmm. than probably any horror movie. Mm -hmm. And I don't consider Pee Wee's Big Adventure a horror movie. It's got to have blood and guts and murder. Huh? The Lion King has blood and guts and murder, buddy. Mm -hmm. I don't consider that a horror movie. So um, it's just, it's really hard to lock down what a horror movie is. So, mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing I love about this genre. We talk about all the subgenres of horror and really you could lump these into so many different subgenres. Like, let's talk about Psycho for a second. Psycho could genuinely be a slasher film. I think it could also be a psychological thriller. Oh, and absolutely. These can genuinely be more than one thing all the time. So um, now I do want to, don't want to get too far off track. I want to bounce back to Squirm real quick. Um, I, I watched this movie last night in preparation for this. And wow. Wow. <laughs> um, do you can remember which scene it was that affected you the most? For me, and what's funny is because I, I rewatched it this week to kind of just refresh my brain. It had been a little bit since I've seen it. And I've always, the shower moment has always really, really stuck out for me to the point where I actually thought it was a longer scene than it was. It's actually a really quick moment where you have, she goes and she turns the shower on, the heroine, and the worms start to come down through the shower head. Yeah. And you're sitting here and they're slowly elongating and you're like, oh, they're going to fall on her. They're going to eat her. They're going to bite her. And then like she turns the faucet again and they kind of back up. And it happens more than once. And that may have been where in my brain, this was like a, a full scene scene because the, the sister does mm -hmm. the same thing. And then later they open the door of the bathroom and worms just or out but man that the visual of those worms i can still even like I, I can call that up in my brain at any time and always have been able to uh it just it stuck out so much because you're so vulnerable in the shower so yeah. this idea you know something is coming down you're oh it's terrifying it's so scary <laughs> And what I love about this is you, when you talk about how she turns it off and they go back, that's really the sound they make. Yeah. You nailed that right on the head. So <laughs> it was really nice to hear you doing the actual sound effects for the film. Um, but no, you're right. I mean, you look at, you know, Squirm being a perfect example. I know I just talked about it, but Psycho, uh, yeah. What Lies Beneath, what you know, another oh, film yeah. that 
mm -hmm. uh, really has those, uh, you know, those it, super scary moments in a shower or a bath. Mm -hmm. And um, like, you're right. That's where you're vulnerable. This is my time for me. And mm -hmm. I'm naked. And, and you're naked and I'm you're trying to, yeah, eat like, this is, it, yeah. Cause as a man, the first, the when it is cover giggle and kick you know like that's <laughs> what you do you know <laughs> and i don't know if that's what i would do if it was a worm it was you know? a worm like, right i don't know if that would be if that would be my you know train of action would be to cover kick and giggle he it's a worm he uh, no i'm just gonna be running full speed naked through my house and then so slipping on all the slippery words yeah. right what? then i would make the bloop I can make that noise then. Uh, <laughs> so we talk about Kim, which scene affected you the most, but what would you say your favorite scene from Squirm is? Oh, um, I, you know, there's a scene where she has this, this boyfriend who had been visiting from New York city. And that's kind of a running theme throughout is like, Oh, he's from New York city and her next door neighbor, Roger, who's a worm farmer. Cause of course he is. Uh, well, yeah, sure. Yeah, that's that is that is a 100%, you know, what do you do? I'm a worm farmer. Totally. Yes. Awesome. Love it. I'm here for it. Uh, right, right. Roger obviously has a thing for her. And there's a moment where they're they're fishing. And he kind of tries to put the moves on her. And she's like, my bro, no, thank you. And he he falls and ends up like falling on worms. And these worms start burrowing into his face. And he sits up and there's just these worms coming out of his face and the look on the actor's face and he runs like into the water screaming. And there, like, there's so many layers because you're like, what am I watching? Are they eating him from within? Are they now controlling right. him? What just happened? And one of the things I love so much about and, this and movie. This is oh, probably yeah. the most iconic scene in the film. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the scene that usually yeah. pops up of like, you've seen this movie. Here's, you know, worms out of a guy's face. Yeah. Uh, as silly a movie as this is, it, it actually plays things out. It's very well paced. It plays things out very seriously. Even though you're talking about killer worms, it doesn't have the same camp factor as as some of the you know your slugs right. and piranha that are that are so campy like it's silly but also it it's a really well done little creature b movie uh and again yeah. doesn't get doesn't get a lot of attention and it's unfortunate it doesn't and i think that um obviously when people think about stuff like this they're going to go to tremors they're oh, going sure. to go to Slither. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you got these other movies that you know, really eclipse this because you think about it. I think it gets a bad rep because of, the, you know, the description. Killer worms. People are, oh, really worms. But no, movie genuinely has layers. I could watch this movie again and just, you know, you find... I, did, I haven't watched it in probably 10 to 15 years before yeah. I rewatched it. And I still had a great time watching this film. So mm -hmm. one question I've been asking recently, Kim, and this yeah. is a perfect example of this. Right now... You know that requels, sequels, uh -huh. prequels, it's kind of all the rage right now. You know, we're we're getting a requel to The Exorcist. We are in the midst of the Halloween scream requel craze yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. Is Squirm a movie you would like to see remade today? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I will say I try to go into any kind of, of requel, whatever we're at, uh, with an open mind. Because there's been some genuinely very good ones. I think a movie like Squirm, I would be open to seeing it happen. My concern would be part of why this movie works is it is kind of like low budget and dirty, mm -hmm. which is something very unique to the 70s. <laughs> it's hard to achieve that now. I mean, you found footage, maybe you could kind of get a similar. But I'd almost be worried that in... It would almost turn into like a low budget sci-fi movie where in in trying to make it updated for 2022 it, it it really does get like cheesy in a bad way and it's almost too slick and too cgi like cgi worms no i want to see these real or practical, practical effect worms yeah, yeah. 
that's a, a CGI worm is not going to be creepy or scary or anything. It's going to be like, oh, look, a computer generated worm. Hmm. Right. So See, the only time I'm okay with something like that, especially with a creature feature is if you're using everything practical and yeah. you use CGI as like the salt and pepper, you know, just seasoning oh, on top absolutely. of the steak, absolutely. Then I'm cool with it. Mm -hmm. um, because i feel the same way as you you know growing up i think it's the i, I think i'm a, a couple moons older than you kim but uh you know growing up watching the movies that we watched um practical effects were very very important at that, that time and you could really mm -hmm. tell when something was done practically and when it wasn't and yeah today it still is like that you watch movies from a, you know 10 15 years ago like freddie versus jason and you see how that cgi just does not fucking mm -hmm. hold up at all mm -hmm. and i would rather look at a practical effect that doesn't hold up than a cgi effect that doesn't hold up at least with that practical effect when i watch it and i see it doesn't hold up i know someone put their blood sweat and tears yeah. into that practical effect to try to make it as great as they possibly could for me so mm -hmm. um, that is one thing i agree with when it comes to creature features and things of the sort give me something that is practical and like we were just talking about slither um, Slither did have its fair amount of CGI, but it was the salt and pepper. It was mostly practical stuff that they did. And that's what I would like to see if they did a sequel, prequel, requel, whatever to uh, Squirm. Now we talk about Squirm and that was your first horror movie and what that movie means to you. And obviously it's special. You watched it with your mother. Uh, my mother's the one that got me into horror, you know, so I, I get that. I know how that goes, but now my little buddy Ghostface here has a question for you, Kim. Ooh. What's your favorite scary movie, Kim? Oh. <laughs> what is your favorite <laughs> horror movie of all time? That's such a hard, hard question. Um, I have, uh, I will say there's this, and it's kind of a weird one, but the theater nerd in me has always loved this movie. Um, it's a Brian De Palma film. It's an early Brian De Palma film called Phantom of the Paradise. Which I think someone else had mentioned on an episode. I was looking okay. at some of your past episodes and I was like, oh, someone else did Phantom of the Paradise? Um, it's a I'm pretty horror sure it was dice. Dice yeah, rolling. Yes. It's a horror rock yeah. musical uh that's like Phantom of the Opera meets Faust meets Disco. It's ridiculous and weird, but it's also very Brian De Palma. Uh mm -hmm. so I've always had that's always been one that I come back to as as just utterly happy and weird and fun and cool. And I love movies from the 70s. Um, that being said, Candyman. I am a I, I saw Candyman when I was young and it it has it it lodged in my heart and Tony Todd lodged in my soul and has never yeah. left. I will tell you this. Um you got the uh <sighs> Like mm -hmm. that to me, like, oh, I'll never get over the yeah. first time I had seen that. That really, really blew my mind the first time. Candyman scared me as a kid, you know, like, it, uh, oh, yeah, it really genuinely scared me as a kid. Um, and I, there's so much about that film, like, there's these layers to it. Like, me and Ashley, we went and visited Cabrini Green, um, mm. about two months ago, and they, it's mm. amazing how, like, we got pictures, we put them up on social media and such, but they literally whitewashed a lot uh, like we were standing in front of the church that they had in cabrini green yeah and it doesn't have any of the you know the mural that was painted on it it's all oh. just literally whitewashed and it's disgusting and oh. you know I, we went there we took our kids on a little mini vacation we were filming a movie out there and we went out there and we were like we got to go see cabrini green like if we're here we've got to go and see cabrini green and don't get me wrong it was amazing but at the same time it was just like super heartbreaking to see this once you know this place that was so influential and important to the black community has now literally been whitewashed out of existence. Yeah. And it was super heartbreaking to look at this and see it like that because we have enough of that. You know, I, I, I really wanted to go and see that. And, you know, a lot of the people that put, like I said, that mural was beautiful on that church and to see, it's just a white building. That was just very heartbreaking for us. So, um, I do want to real quick, we're talking about how amazing your first tour movie experience was. And I want to bounce back to that real quick, because before I let you go, we always end this with the same question. We end it with a skull count. Now, what we're going to do, Kim, with Squirm, we're not going to be judging this on acting, production, score, nothing like that. We're not being critics. Right. What we're doing is we're strictly judging this movie on how much it affected you on first viewing. So zero skulls being not effective. Mm -hmm. 
five being extremely effective, you can use half and quarter skulls anywhere in the middle. What would your ranking of squirm be? I got to give it five. It, uh, uh, it was it was like this was the foundation of everything that came after for me. So it it just it affected me. It left an impact and influenced the rest of my life. <laughs> that's that's incredible to hear. Um, and what I love is you can always go back and remember Squirm is where it started for you. Mm-hmm. You know, like for me, it it was House. You know, House oh. nineteen eighty six. Yes. It was the first horror movie that I had ever seen. It's the first uh-huh. horror movie that I fell in love with. Uh, so it's just, it's a movie that will always be super important to me. And I know that that's what Squirm is to you just from conversations that we've had. So um, I do want to remind everybody, we are at the end of the third act. The credits are about to roll and the curtain's about to drop. But before it does, there's some social media links down here that need your attention and a podcast that needs some listening to. So please make sure you're checking that out. Uh, Kim, don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Mm-hmm. Everybody else, as always, keep talking horror. Stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.